Um, this is a welcome to the 10th special meeting of the Lynn School Committee, Thursday, Thursday August 27th, 2020. Uh, this is Mayor Tom McGee, and I'd like to say good evening and thank you for joining us. This open meeting of this open meeting of the Lynn School Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020. Uh, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth and the, and the city due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. Um, in order to mitigate the transmission of COVID-19 virus, we've been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to, to, uh, to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting is on the city website, allows public bodies to meet entire, entirely remotely so as long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will not feature public comment. For this meeting, the Lynn School Department is convened by telephone conference via video conference via the Zoom platform and a media cast live stream as posted on the city and school website. In addition, the meeting can be viewed on Comcast channels three and 22 and Verizon channels 37 and 38. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Uh, <clears throat> Um, before we get into the first items on the agenda, uh, I'll permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate, me accurate meeting minutes. As chairman, I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, question, or motions. Please until, hold until your name is called. Uh, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Uh, please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Yeah. For any response, please wait until the chair leads, yields the floor to you and start state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in discussion with other members, please do so through the chair. Again, uh, taking care to identify yourselves. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call. And I just want to be clear uh, for those that are listening uh, or have not been able to connect on Zoom that this is a, a lot being um, uh, broadcast live on LCTV. Again, the stations that I've listed. Uh, or you can get on the website, the LCT, LCTV website, and it's being live streamed as well. So this is available through a number of different um, uh, media outlets to ensure that this is, if, if uh, Zoom, the Zoom is filled, uh, but we have definitely access through those other means uh, to ensure that people can watch the meeting and follow the meeting along. Uh, before we get started, um, on the orders of business, I would like to ask uh, Nan to uh, do a, a roll call of the members and uh, of those uh, from uh, the administration and uh, that are part of our weekly, uh, of our, a part of our meetings to uh, also uh, take a roll call on those as well. So Nan, if you'd be, I would like to get started on that, please. Uh, Mr. Cassianos. Present. Ms. Capola. Present. Mr. Ford. Present. Ms. Gagner. Present. Mr. Nicholson? Present. Santa White? Present. Mayor McGee? Present. And um, observing Dr. Trollheimer? Present. And um, Dan Rogerio? Present. Who did I forget? My mind just went blank. Kevin yeah. McHugh? Present. Kimberly Powers? Present. Thank you. And John Myos? Thank you, John. Present. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, first uh, order of business, I'd like, uh, and I know there is a flag that uh, is being displayed. Um, Dawn has a flag displayed in the committee room, so we ask everyone to stand and join us in the salute to the United States, uh, to the flag of the United States of America. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 
I would ask that you stand uh, for a moment and we will have a moment of silence for Edwin Perez Osorio, an English high school student, and Brenda Ann Beal, uh, our member, uh, Michael Satterwhite's mother, um, who we offer our condolences as well. And I would ask for a moment of silence um, in, in memory of both of those. Thank you. Um, first on the agenda is minutes. Um, we have uh, a, a, a number of minutes uh, that are listed uh, looking for a motion. Make a motion that we accept the seventh special meeting on July 27, 2020. The motion is there a second? Second. Uh, roll call. Mr. Castellanos? Yes. Mr. Carla? Yes. Mr. Ford? Yes. Ms. Gately? Ms. Gately? Yes. Mr. Nicholson? Yes. Mr. Fowler? Yes. Yes. I'd like to make a motion to accept the minutes of the personnel subcommittee meeting on August 5th, 2020. Second. Uh, roll call required. It's been a uh, motion and second. Yes. Mr. Carl? Yes. Mr. Ford? Yes. Mr. Stanley? Yes. Mr. Nicholson? Yes. Mr. Satellite? Yes. Mr. Yes. I'd like to make a motion to accept the minutes of the eighth special meeting on August 5th, 2020. Second. There's a, a motion made and second. Roll call required. Mr. Cassianos? Yes. Mr. Carla? Yes. Mr. Ford? Yes. Ms. Gately? Yes. Mr. Nicholson? Yes. Mr. Satellite? Yes. Mr. D. Yes. Next up, it is not on the agenda, and I'll ask John if we need a, a roll call uh, to do this, but um, Sheila O'Neill is asked to uh, uh, get a chance to make a statement to the committee um, as we go into our de uh, deliberations on a number of things tonight, which I am, um, will, uh, am, uh, will allow her to do that. So I don't know, John, if I have to uh, get- um, Motion to suspend the rules, Mr. Mayor. Motion, motion to suspend the rules um, to allow Sheila O'Neill to address the committee. Is there a, is there a second? Second. Uh, requires a roll call. Is that Sheila? Sheila O'Neill. Yes. All right, uh, Mrs. Castellanos? Yes. Mr. Paula? Yes. Mr. Ford? Yes. Ms. Gailey? Yes. Mr. Nicholson? Yes. Mr. Senator White? Yes. Mr. Yes. yes. So with that, uh, I know Sheila is on the Zoom. Uh, if uh, she can be, I yep. see you, Sheila. I see you, Sheila. Okay. Good evening, Sheila O'Neill, uh, 200 Locust Street, and president of the Lynn Teachers Union. Um, in light of the report regarding airflow issues that was um, out from the State House yesterday, and the fact that Lynn is the epicenter of the pandemic currently in Massachusetts. I am asking the district to reconsider in-person professional development on Monday, 8.31 and Tuesday, 9.1. As per our uh, memorandum of agreement for the calendar signed on August 5th, the in-person professional development was agreed upon provided the following. Safety measures are negotiated and agreed, which we have requested a report of air quality and building safety from an outside agency as well as the COVID-19 data remaining at a consistent or better than current levels. At that time, there were nine new cases in Lynn, and today we had 15 new cases in Lynn. And our weekly average uh, yesterday was 6.08%. In March, we closed with a 5% rating. Clearly, our city is not prepared to have 100% 100 plus educators 
in any building at this time. If Manning Field, an open arena, is closed, how can we send members of our workforce into buildings with poor air quality and ventilation? I am requesting that no teacher, paraprofessional, or therapist be mandated to enter a building until we have received the air quality report from training and the COVID-19 levels have reduced to yellow rating. I have no written evidence that our buildings are safe for our members. It does not make sense to send the full body of staff into buildings for professional development being presented virtually. Also, someone could video the tour through each building and present to staff in a Zoom meeting. There is no logical reason to demand educators be in the building on August 31st and September 1st. The September 14th and September 15th in-person professional development should be decided based on the data closer to that time. Safety first, our lives are vital. Respectfully, the Lynn Teachers Union. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Um, thank you, Sheila. And uh, with that, we're on to our next agenda items. Uh, those are appointment and elections. Uh, Dr. Tutwiler, would you like to uh, speak to that? Glad to. Um, we have three people that we're welcoming. Uh, one person we're welcoming new to the district uh, and two others that we're uh, welcoming to different positions. Uh, the first, uh, who was not on the Zoom but did send an email, uh, is Andrea Taddeo, who is uh, replacing Michelle Winslow. Uh, as the program specialist at Drew Druitt's Elementary. Uh, by way of quick reminder, uh, Michelle uh, Winslow is now the Assistant Director uh, for Reading and English Language Arts um, in the Curriculum Office. Um, a, a name that should ring familiar, um, uh, first from the standpoint of excellence um, in instruction, but also uh, Skills USA, uh, Claire Price, uh, has been appointed the, the special education department head at Lynn Tech. Uh, and then finally, uh, Bobby Serino, uh, who's done an excellent job as a tech, has been appointed the PC land manager. I want to wish all three uh, well in their, in their new roles, and um, uh, we're excited to, to work with them going forward. Great. Well, uh, thank you for that, and we welcome them aboard. Uh, and wish them the best as they move forward now uh, with their work every day for the students in the city of Lynn. Um, next on the agenda is a presentation and it's an opportunity on um, Dr. Tutwiler, uh, update on the reopening. Would you, uh, uh, are you ready to uh, present? Uh, I am. Great, thank you. Share my screen here. Second. Can I just see a nod if you can see that? Yes, okay, great. Uh, so um, the last time we met August 5th, uh, which is only a little more than two weeks ago, <clears throat> a lot has happened since then, both in uh, the realm of um, you know regulation and guidance. Um, and our planning and work here uh, in the district. And I just wanted to give a brief overview of some of the things that we uh, have accomplished uh, and some of the things that we've done and some of the things that we're preparing to do uh, and the time that we have left before the launch. Uh, just by way of reminder, if I can get my screen, uh, there we go. Um, when we met last uh, on the 5th, uh, I proposed uh, a launch to the school year of remote learning for most students uh, and then in-person services for students in our special education self-contained classes. Uh, I think we all know that about a week later, uh, a metric was released um, that indicated uh, Lynn to be in uh, the red category, which means that they uh, strongly encourage, not mandate, uh, that we uh, engage in remote instruction. But given that uh, Lynn was uh, at the time about three times higher than the threshold 
for being a community that's in the red. We really felt like the the, the safest approach to instruction uh, was to uh, provide that for all students in remote fashion. And so since then, um, we've really been uh, intentional and, and adamant, frankly, about uh, bringing the community in, uh, communicating, uh, providing information, communicating in a way that's two-way, allowing um, our, our, our colleagues and, uh, and families to ask questions. Uh, we've done that through now seven virtual town halls. Uh, we provide plenty of written information, but we really feel like the opportunity for folks to interact uh, with us and ask questions has been uh, really important. Uh, we've also been working really closely with um, what I would call our partner agencies um, to make sure that uh, the efforts are aligned. Uh, we're all mission driven with respect to serving students and, and families well, uh, but we're really making an effort to lean on one another uh, to provide supports for students as they uh, engage in a brand new school year in a way that they, that they never have before. Um, there's a lot on this slide, but I, it's just a snapshot or a, a snip of um, our reopening safely uh, environment. Uh, it's just beneath my uh, ugly mug on the uh, district's homepage. Uh, in it, there's there's a wealth of information uh, for families, and we try to uh, you know organize it in a way that's accessible, uh, not overwhelming. Uh, this is the communications page where you can see all of the recent uh, written communications available for families. And also uh, if they weren't able to join us for a town hall and, and would like to watch, uh, they're, they're welcome to. And you can see at the top of, um, of the SNP, there's um, uh, several tabs, uh, which will bring families to uh, specific information, whether it's our uh, frequently asked questions page, they're interested in the calendar when school is starting, one of the breaks, uh, or if they have an interest in reading the reopening plan, which has schedules and information around uh, health and safety and essentially how we're attempting to uh, educate their, their students uh, this year. All of that is available for families um, in this space. Um, we've been working really, really hard to create a learning scenario uh, for staff uh, that will help us uh, open in as smooth a, a fashion as possible. Uh, by way of reminder, uh, the commissioner shortened the school year by 10 days, excuse me, yeah, by 10 days. And uh, those 10 days will be to be dedicated to professional development, all of which uh, should happen before the first day of instruction. Uh, I've talked about this before. I talked a little bit about it uh, when we were together on the 5th. But here you can just get a sense. This is uh, the first week of some of the kinds, some of the things that will be going on uh, in professional development, uh, a really heavy focus on uh, acquainting staff with uh, Schoology, our learning management system, uh, certainly health and safety, uh, big emphasis on trauma-informed practice. Um, that's actually going to be a consistent theme at faculty meetings uh, throughout the year. Uh, but there's a, a foundational approach right there in the beginning in the first week. Uh, and in the second week, uh, you know, sort of a similar theme around uh, practice with Schoology. We were really intentional uh, about providing time for staff to, once they've sort of gotten into the environment uh, and sort of learned how to work it, uh, then creating content, um, you know, creating units, uh, really getting familiar uh, and, and uh, building substantive learning experiences uh, for kids. Uh, you'll also notice that uh, ELE stands for English Learner Education. Uh, this is year three uh, with a district-wide focus on professional development in that realm. Uh, and we are going to continue with that. Uh, this year, in addition to strategy, uh, there's also a heavy emphasis on equity, race and equity. Uh, and there's another piece of that professional development I'll speak to in the superintendent's report related to um, the resolution that the school committee adopted in June. 
Uh, but this gives you a sense um, at a high level, uh, and this is the overview uh, view of professional development, but it gives you a sense for uh, what we've planned for um, beginning Monday, and we're excited to, to get going with staff. Just a brief update on technology. Uh, as of today, we've distributed about 10,000 devices. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, just over 16,000 students. Uh, recall that we have devices for students in grades uh, 3 through 12. Um, and students uh, in kindergarten, first grade, and second grade um, total in terms of the, uh, their enrollment, about 4,000 students. So um, we're really about 2,000 students shy of every student uh, for whom we have a device at this point having one, uh, which I think is pretty impressive. Uh, at this point, there's going to be a, a really big push uh, over the next two weeks. Um, to get the remaining 2,000 students in in grades 3 through 12 uh, to, to get a device. On the next bullet point, you can see that uh, we, we've actually uh, were awarded a grant uh, to help us purchase devices for students in K-2. Um, we, we've known about this for a while, but it's, it was embargoed. Uh, so we already put that order in, and we're, we're hopeful that we, we get those devices as soon as possible and get them in the hands uh, of what I call our littles. Um, and there's also some additional funds for uh, tech-related su supplies, things like sleeves, protective covers, uh, things uh, of that nature. Um, it's not new news that we had a partnership uh, with Comcast to provide in-home internet access for uh, families who do not have it. Uh, the company has been uh, really amazing. Um, Previously, uh, if a family had any sort of negative experience, an outstanding balance or something of that nature uh, with Comcast, they would not provide uh, that in-home um, resource for them. Uh, they since waived that feature. So now any family, regardless of their history, if they do not have uh, internet in the home, uh, that it will be provided and uh, the, the bill will be sent to the Lynn Public Schools. Um, to the tune of $10 a month per family or per household. Um, they've also uh, committed to us that any family, there are not many homes that don't have the infrastructure for um, setting up or turning on uh, uh, a Wi-Fi in the home, uh, but any home that does not, for whatever reason, the company is committed to um, installing whatever is needed so that that family can access internet. So. Um, Thumbs up to uh, Comcast. Uh, and then finally, um, Dr. Tawila, can I just speak to that briefly? Please. Because I, I, I know we talked and I had gotten uh, 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 um, a correspondence from someone who was having difficulty in their home with some, some number of students, uh, directed it to you. And, and I just wanted to be clear for the members and others that are hearing that the, that's such an important point for the, um, the internet access. So I know that you were working on that with the specific um, request, but I think it's important for people to know if they that they can absolutely reach out and, and uh, you will be working with them to ensure that everybody has access uh, from the internet. So I just think that's an important point to, to reiterate. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, when come and pick up the device, um, this resource is explained to them. Um, you know, we'll be doing some additional outreach, um, you know, in the days leading up to the school year. So we really want to make sure, from the standpoint of equity, that everyone has access. Uh, video tutorials. I, I did a, a strike through on that. I mean, we're we're, we're still planning to do uh, a number of uh, video tutorials in the realms of Schoology. Uh, but just today, we posted um, a video tutorial. Uh, kudos to, um, oh, geez, now her name escapes me. At, uh, Lynn. Afton Dean. Thank you, Afton Dean, uh, for creating an awesome, awesome tutorial on how kids go from, you know, unboxing the device to getting it hooked up to uh, wireless. And that's available for families, uh, both in English and Spanish. Uh, good stuff there. 
Uh, in terms of meals, uh, if you recall from the very beginning, we talked about like the, the, the pillars for reopening, um, you know, addressing the hierarchy of need uh, was number one on our list, meaning uh, addressing needs around uh, food security, housing stability, uh, mental and physical health. I mean, that's first. Uh, and so we've, you know, since March, we've been doing the grab and go uh, opportunity for families uh, that continues to this day. Uh, but when the school year starts, we have to play by a slightly different set of rules. Um, and so our plan is um, to start the first three days. Um, a lot, you know, students would go to whatever their district school is or wherever they they go to school or the closest school to their home um, and they can retrieve uh, a meal or they'll have breakfast and lunch in it uh, for that day. We're gonna do it that way for the first three days just to kind of get a sense uh, for you know where the foot traffic is, um, you know how many families are showing up. And then from there, we're planning to do uh, a process where uh, twice a week uh, families would come uh, and, and get meals for the days uh, intervening. Uh, we think that would be more convenient for families not having to come to the school every day to retrieve a meal. Uh, but in these boxes will be uh, enough lunch, enough breakfast and snack uh, to sustain uh, the students uh, until the next day they come and grab another box. Uh, and we're, we're envisioning Monday and Wednesday as being those days uh, this is probably one of those things, having never done it before, that we're going to, you know, there's going to be a little bit of trial and error uh, to kind of see, you know, what works best for families in terms of getting the meals to them. Uh, but this sort of represents our initial thinking. Um, and I know that uh, uh, in years past, um, there's been a lot of conversation about uh, the meals and the quality of the meals. Uh, all of these meals will be fresh, uh, never frozen. I uh, had an opportunity to sample them uh, and, you know, folks can look at me and tell that, you know, I'm not too picky around food, but uh, I will say it was, it was really good stuff. So we're excited that we're, we're able to offer this, but just know going into the year, uh, we may want to shift a little bit to, to come up with a rhythm that works well uh, for kids and for families. Um, in the presentation on um, August 5th, I talked a little bit about the Remote Learning Academy. We're getting a little bit closer to getting this uh, stood up, so to speak. Um, this is, you know, we, we, we always have the uh, potential for returning to in-person learning at some point in the year. Again, uh, we're remote learning for all students until uh, November 20th. Um, and uh, we'll reassess at that point. Uh, but for families who have a child who is medically fragile or simply, you know, for whatever reason, are not interested in in-person learning at all for the year, uh, we wanted there to be an option uh, for them. We're very close to finalizing this. Uh, there was a survey that went out uh, last week uh, to families that ends tomorrow to sort of gauge uh, in a non-binding way um, families who are interested in this option. Uh, right now, we're at about 230 families who, who have expressed interest. And so uh, our plan is to finalize um, with the third party vendor uh, who thus far has some really impressive um, attributes, uh, provide families with um, an info session so that they can make an informed, decision, uh, an, an informed decision on whether or not this is the best fit for them. Uh, and then and then launch from there. Uh, and then finally, I believe this is the last slide. A um, uh, lot of talk about uh, high school athletics. Uh, there's a lot of uh, language on this slide. I'll, I'll just give you a quick uh, overview. Um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and the Mass Interscholastic Athletic Association have come up with a joint guidance on athletics that essentially says that any community or high school that's in a community that is deemed uh, in the red, cat, red uh, category uh, and is opening the school year in remote learning uh, has to postpone their fall season. 
Uh, you'll notice uh, the bullets below the overview uh, give you a sense for each of the um, potential seasons. Um, the, 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 the guidance calls for us to postpone and lend uh, our fall season till at least um, the, what they're calling the floating season or float season. It's the bold season down, down below. Um, I, I, I can say right now that there's interest among the uh, Northeast Conference schools to uh, postpone all fall athletics until that floating season, uh, all of the schools doing that. Uh, there was a principal and athletic director vote to do so earlier this week, and there's another uh, vote that needs to take place in order for that to be the case. So there is still the possibility uh, for the kids who attend English and classical uh, to have the fall sports that are permissible, but during that floating season. Um, we're, we're, we're working on a different pathway uh, for tech because they don't belong to that uh, conference. Uh, but that's where we are right now as it relates to athletics. Uh, for the winter sports, uh, that's sort of a, a wait and see kind of scenario. Um, it's going to be based in large part on, you know, where the state is in terms of health and safety uh, as to whether or not basketball uh, or, or the contact sports can be played. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll stay in touch with, uh, with families about that as it happens. But right now, uh, we feel optimistic about some fall sports happening in the float season um, for students at English and Classical, and we're working on something for tech. That is not all. I have a little bit more. Uh, so uh, some of the things that we're, we're still working on and, and plan to, to get out uh, in short order, um, we want to create a scenario or, or a document for families that sort of helps them get set up uh, for success in their homes uh, for students learning at home. Um, at, at this point, I could say, you know, I've received probably a dozen emails from families asking for some advice around that. So we're, we're preparing a guidance document to, to help families in that way. Uh, video tutorials, uh, more of those uh, in the realm, as I mentioned earlier, uh, of navigating Schoology, which um, I've had uh, an opportunity myself to, to spend some time in it. It is a very, very accessible uh, platform. Uh, so we're hopeful uh, that we'll be achieving success with it. But it's, nonetheless, we want to make sure the families have an opportunity um, to, to learn about it and have some extra help at their fingertips in terms of um, uh, in the way of video tutorials. I already spoke about the devices for K-2. Uh, those have been ordered. Um, and then finally, um, um, you know, in the town halls, families and in emails directly to me, uh, and in a couple of cases, uh, some phone calls directly to me, uh, families have expressed uh, the real challenge around uh, balancing uh, work and um, young children who will be learning in remote fashion. And I, I understand that completely. Um, we're working on a plan that's still in beta format, but uh, in partnership with um, uh, some of the our partner agencies in the city uh, to help them expand um, their plan in terms of adding more students. Uh, to their daytime programs. Um, so a little bit early to speak in details about that, but uh, we're working as quickly as we can to get that uh, in place um, and communicate it to families. Questions? Questions from uh, members? Uh, member Nicholson, and then Member Ford, and then Member Sadoway. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Dr. Tallwire, for that presentation and to, to you and your team and all the uh, teachers who have been working hard to plan for the upcoming fall. Um, I know how difficult this time is. Uh, had a couple of sort of specific questions about reopening, but you know, just wanted to check because I uh, appreciate hearing from the uh, Lynn Teachers Union President Sheila O'Neill, uh, and obviously this was a topic that was covered in your presentation. Uh, is that is this something you're going to cover now in terms of uh, where that stands, or something that we're going to 
do in executive session? What's the what's the what's the next step there? Um, you know, I would defer to the mayor or John on that, but uh, it's my understanding that it, that uh, conversation will happen in executive session first. John, John Myles. But can, can you hear me? Yes. I agree with the I agree with the superintendent properly in executive session. Okay. Okay. Um, do you have another question? Um, do you have another question as well? But, uh, yes. Yes, that's okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, for sure. Um. So, my other question uh, was around the the meal schedule. Can you talk a little bit more about the the sort of reasoning for reducing the frequency and uh, sort of what the, any, any risk there would be for people who missed the day, um, any opportunities that would be for, for, for people to get meals if they weren't available for that day for whatever reason, um, to make sure that we, like you said, are honoring that as a really top priority and, and, a, and a huge risk of going remote uh, for students to not have access to those, to those daily meals. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Um, the, the, the quick answer is convenience for families. Um, you know, we, we, you know, and, and that those first three days will be helpful for us in terms of understanding, um, you know, kind of what the, what the patterns are and where, what the needs are and where the, you know, which schools are, are seeing the most activity. Um, but we wanted to craft a scenario that we thought was easy for families. Um, certainly, uh, coming every day um, can be a challenge. Um, and so uh, we thought providing uh, the boxes with the, the multiple meals, multiple snacks, um, it seemed like a, a more convenient option. Um, Kevin can speak to, uh, you know, what happens if, you know, geez, we weren't, we weren't able to come on Monday or Wednesday. Uh, we certainly want to create a backup plan for, for those families, but I'll, I'll let Kevin speak to that. Kevin? Kevin McHugh? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, as the superintendent said, I think we were trying to, we said this is like, we kind of introduced as a tentative plan. Uh, what we found is that um, families, are, you know, have mentioned this on a daily basis that are coming. It's it's really, uh, I think, more of a convenience factor for them. Uh, the contingency plan, I suppose, could be that we could have meals available on other days. But what we're trying to do is get the most amount of people to the building as, as soon as possible. And by giving multiple meals out, the idea would be that people would gravitate to coming because we're finding on Certain days, people just aren't coming, or like when we give up the summer meals on Friday, it's our busiest day. So, we're, you know, where they're getting multiple meals and they like that idea. So, we were trying to use a platform to move forward in the school year. And if it needs to be adjusted, it'll be adjusted. But uh, other agencies have done boxes as, as well. And we thought that this would be, you know, where students are pretty much going to be online up until a certain time you know, make it a little more convenient than having to run every single day from the time they get off the computer down to a school to grab a lunch, they could get the box and it would make it a little more, uh, you know, a steady Mondays and Wednesdays, uh, you know, and if we would adjust it if there were holidays and things of that nature. But we would, it's a fluid plan. We're trying to get something going to see if it works. And if it doesn't, we'll adjust on the fly too. Got it. That's, that's really helpful. Um, the and and I mean, yeah, I think that's going to be important to leave that option open. But that sounds that sounds great. Uh, my my last question was about the Schoology. Um, you know, obviously, there's so much there's so much uh, to be nervous about, to be concerned about about this upcoming year and everything that's happened. Uh, hopefully, one of the things I'm hopeful for is that we will find some silver linings and 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 sort of rely on the resourcefulness and the creativity of our of our teachers and our educators to to, to do things differently to make remote learning more uh, closer to the, the our, our goal of giving every student the, the learning they deserve. Um, one of the things that I think has the potential about remote learning is that we're in 
we're literally inside of our family's homes in ways we haven't been before. Um, what do students learn from home um, and maybe some opportunities around uh, sort of encouraging um, collaboration with parents and, 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 and guardians and, and communication with parents and guardians. Uh, one of the things I, I, I was wondering if it was possible and would love to see is that as we are sort of confirming that every student has a laptop and every student has internet access at home and every student is logging on and tracking that data and um, about attendance and, and access, could we also uh, track sort of uh, family communication? You know, like find like in the first week, say we, we have confirmed that we have interacted with, we've gotten communication back from X percent of the, all the families in the district so that we know that hopefully that'll be 100% very early in the year and that we know that everybody is logged on and knows how to keep it, enter into a back and forth with us. Um, and, and who I imagine that would be through Schoology, but whatever the platform is that the, 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 the parent is, is or the, the family is using um, and, and, and sort of use that data. Yeah, that, that is uh, totally possible. Um, you, you know, it, I, I can say this now, in the days of old with Jupiter, uh, one of the wonderful features uh, was its ability to capture um, student, um, you know, interactions within the uh, platform, but also parent. Uh, and so that is absolutely something that we can capture. We are um, really being thoughtful about uh, parent uh, involvement, parent partnership uh, in this process uh, and understanding how key it is to the success of, of this launch. Uh, but yes, yeah, so the, the answer to your question is uh, yes, there is a way to capture that uh, in a way that is quantitative and presentable. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, next member, Ford. Uh, Pat, just a quick question um, on the August 31st on the calendar, it said district welcome, and that was on a professional development day. How extensive is that? How, how much, how many, how many were that involved? How many people? Yeah. Uh, one. Uh, that's, that's a video uh, that I made okay. <laughs> uh, to welcome staff back. Okay. Uh, you, you can watch it. You're welcome to watch it. Uh, welcome to watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that so uh, you know, for the folks that attended the um, uh, our welcoming last year at uh, at City Hall, um, you know, during it there was a video montage that was just really awful, uh, awesome. Like it, it really tugged at at our heart our heartstrings and um, really showed what our community is all about. Uh, and so uh, another one has been made with an introduction uh, by me. That's what that district welcome is. Okay, thank you. I hope it's as good as last year's. Great, thank you, member four. Member Satterwhite, then member Gately. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so I just have a couple questions, uh, Patrick. Um, the first one being, uh, I'm happy that uh, Comcast has stepped up and, and really uh, contributed greatly to uh, to our city and to our most needy um, and vulnerable uh, citizens. But you need electricity to have internet. Have we reached out to National Grid? Do we do we have any idea if they're doing shutoffs or whatnot at this point? And how long would that hold be, or and what we would do um, if if a uh, student's electricity was shut off? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a stone we've not yet turned. Um, you know, part of me feels like um, the approach to that would be to partner with uh, other superintendents, neighboring superintendents, Chelsea, Revere, Salem, where similar challenges uh, might exist and see if we can, uh, you know, have a unified voice around the importance of this. Um, but that's not something that we've yet uh, addressed. But okay. Great. Perfect. So, and I, I'll just um, and, quick, uh, quick speak to them. Um, I think under the current um, eviction uh, moratorium, uh, um, it's my understanding, and I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that uh, shutoffs and all of that are are part of that moratorium uh, on housing. I think it's a great question as well. Uh, and then um, I think sharing with other communities 
um, once the moratorium uh, runs its course. I do that. I know there are a couple of court cases actually addressing that, but um, I, I think it's a great question, and we'll work together on that. Thank you. And um, I've asked a couple of times about the conditions of our buildings um, going back a few months, and I, I just I haven't received any any type of feedback besides that you, you uh, uh, I. ISD, you know, would be doing it, um, and that there was a third party. So, um, what you did provide to me, and I'm grateful for it, is I, I requested information to City Hall and the District Court as to what they're doing with their staff and general public and the condition of their buildings. So, I was able to get uh, that information, and I appreciate it. But, um, you know, those buildings are old. Some of them don't have AC, you know, um, and the staffing level varies between the two of them. But I'm worried about our buildings. So I just want to make sure that I, I get that information um, back. Do you have a time frame of when uh, you'll be able to share that with us? Yeah. So my understanding is that I will have uh, some reports in hand uh, in about 30 days. Okay. And um, what do we do when? Uh, we try to transition to hybrid on that slide in scale and a large majority of teachers become exposed to COVID. Um, if, 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 you know, if they're all in the same building and someone's exposed, what, what is the plan at that point? Um, do you, do we have a plan on substitute staffing and what are the expectations of teachers that may be in quarantine, uh, uh with regards to their workload? Yeah. So I'll work backward. Uh, if someone has a, uh, you know, doctor or medical professional directed quarantine, uh, there, there's real clear language in the guidance documents around who quarantines uh, or the circumstances under which someone should. Um, I mean, it's our expectation that, um, you know, folks have the tools. Um, you, you should continue to continue to work unless you are unwell. Uh, in which case, you know, it would be, you know, sick time, um, depending on the scenario. Um, you know, th those those uh, scenarios where, which, you know, some would say are the inevitable, where there's, um, you know, spread in a particular school or, you know, in a particular uh, community. And like, what do you what do you do? Uh, I think what you do is, um, you, you know. You, you embrace safety first. Uh, you know, so you, you you shut schools down. You you pivot to remote learning. Um, you know, do we have? Um, you know, this is a scenario if we were in hybrid uh, or in any in-person services. Do we have uh, the capacity to replace um, large numbers of teachers? No. And any district that tells you that they do uh, wouldn't be telling you the truth. Um, that's just not possible. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be asking staff to create, um, you know, just as they would in, in any normal circumstance, you know, historically, um, you know, substitute work. Um, it'll be largely uh, asynchronous uh, work for students to do, whether it's pre-recorded uh, lessons or, or the directing students um, in the direction of uh, videos and assignments, reading. Uh, and then uh, we do have some substitute capacity, uh, but not, not enough to cover, you know, you know, a whole school where, you know, heaven forbid something that catastrophic happened. Thank you. I'm Member Gailey. I'm Member Castellanos and, uh, and then Member Coppola. Member Gately. Um, Dr. Tutwell, I have a few questions. Um, over the last couple of weeks, I, I got a lot of um, emails for the last meeting. Um, but some of the questions, I don't know if they are relevant. Like um, one woman sent me an email, a therapist to provide teleservices from home. It's easier to do it from home than at the school. The therapists for special ed, teleservices. Mm -hmm. um, you could look into that. Maybe that would be good. certainly. I, I mean, is this being was that presented to you as uh, the unit would prefer to do that from home or an individual? Individual. Prefer? Okay. 
Okay, and um, then I know that the computers have been ready for a pickup for a while. So um, how many computers have been distributed right now? Like how many um, people have come in and got their computers so they can be working with them and trying them out and seeing how to use them? And how many have been left? Do we have any teachers still not getting their computers? Um, the parents, when did they get their computers? Um, so those are the questions yeah. I could talk to you about because everybody should have a computer as a teacher at this point, I believe, but I'm not sure. Uh, the, the opportunity for uh, our staff to retrieve a device has been there. Um, we've got... Um, when did that start? Say again? When did it start that that oh. they were available for them to come and get them? Um, someone would have to keep me honest. Maybe a month ago. Uh, the weeks tend to run together for me. There yeah. have been multiple dates and times for staff uh, to pick up computers. When did, um, when did it start, Deb? Say about uh, a month ago? I want to say at least a month ago. Okay. Okay, so everyone right now should have a computer. They should well, if they picked it up. Yeah. But Okay. We've got about uh, uh, 430 staff who've not yet uh, retrieved the device. Uh, we just invited paraprofessionals uh, to pick up a device today. Um, so it's, you know, they're going to be coming in tomorrow. They can retrieve it on Monday. Um, yeah. And that yeah. 430 does not include uh, the paraprofessionals. Okay. And then... Um... K through two will be receiving them sometime during the fall. Right. So th this is the part that's really hard. I mean, the minute we got the news about that grant award, uh, you know, literally we got the, uh, Kevin can keep me honest here. We got the letter on a Saturday morning. Uh, that Monday we ordered devices. Um, you know, the challenge is um, everyone's ordering devices. Um, and, Supply lines are um, have been interrupted uh, because of all the factors related to COVID nineteen, so it's slower, um, you know. But 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 we're we're, we're on top of it um, sometime this fall. Okay, and then there's um, looking at your slideshow. There was one little criteria because um, I was wondering about sports. Say that again. Sports. Um, yeah. I was wondering about golf because they allow us to have golf. So why couldn't the golf teams play? It's because we're in a red district, or two criteria. Uh, if your community is uh, designated as red and you're starting uh, the school year in remote fashion, then you have to postpone your fall season. All of the sports. Okay. So. But I think it's going to be awfully hard to play golf in February. Could be. I'm praying so for a, uh, for a warm that? winter, mild winter. Yeah. Well, I don't think we're going to. Almanac doesn't doesn't think we're going to have that, but you know, no, but, uh, never know. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Mikhail Solanos. I'm member Capola. Um, Patrick, Doctor Tuttle, uh, thank you so much for um, for your presentation. I want to really. Um, also, thank Link Community Television for always, you know, streaming our uh, communications constituents. Um, <laughs> it's, um, I know, first part of what I'm kind of pointing out is uh, communication. Um, you know, I appreciate the efforts being made. I know you had the virtual town halls, you had the tutorials, the website, um, but I can't emphasize how important it is to over communicate what we're doing, what the, what our plan is, what the routine is going to be. Um, especially with us going into the red category, we have um, a lot of folks with anxiety. With you know, there's a lot of health risks. A lot of lot, there's a lot of a lot of factors that are, are, are playing into um, not really processing the communication effectively. Um, I've I've met families who still um, are confused of where we're gonna, where we're going to be at. I have teachers uh, who have very valid um, points when we when we look to. Um, when we are move, obviously look to move forward, um, could we enhance our Facebook social media presence? Is that something that's possible? Because when I analyze our Facebook social media, 
um, post, it looks like, you know, we, we do it one day at a time and it would be really good to, to really increase that. I don't know who's working that uh, platform, but I would love to see that. Uh, and not just me, I have uh, constituents who've reached out to ask. Uh, that's, that's how they get their source of information. I want to thank Mayor Tom McGee and his staff as well. Uh, I know when you guys when you guys put out your information, I have constituents that uh, access information that way. But if we could kind of centralize that communication, um, and I know that's been brought up in the past a lot. Um, is that something that we could probably improve on for our re reopening communications? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess um, uh, I'm just trying to understand the feedback. I mean, I, I definitely understand and embrace the feedback of, you, you know, more communication is better. Um, you know, at the same time, I don't want to overwhelm families um, with, you know, peppering them with things every day. I, I, we're really trying to be thoughtful about, you know, the things that families should concern themselves with at this point. Um, and, you know, I mentioned that uh, the, the, the website and, you know, I know that websites are uh, a little passe in terms of uh, a communication tool because in this day and age, people are used to things coming to them, not necessarily going to get them, uh, and, and which, which makes uh, Facebook and, you know, Instagram, Twitter uh, effective tools because stuff is coming out that way. Uh, but I'll say that um, at, at this point, um, you know, most of the communication has come from uh, the district level. There's been, of course, some school-based uh, information. And a lot of the questions that I've gotten personally uh, from, from families is, is really like school-based information. Uh, and letters are, are going out to families. Uh, is this uh, next week, uh, Kim Powers? Yeah. Actually, many you're going out today and on Monday from all of the from all of the schools. Yeah. Yes. With with specifics about you know whom to contact, specifics about schedules, which I know is a big question. It is available on the website. We talked about it at the virtual town halls. But uh, you know, I, I'm I'm hearing your feedback about Facebook. We can absolutely ramp that up. Um, the webmaster is largely in in control of that but he puts on what we ask him uh, to put on. Uh, and then uh, Shannon Bansfield also has a hand in um, some of the, the content for that. Um, certainly we can, we can ramp that up. It, thank you. Uh, my next uh, question is around the technology piece. I know the K through 12, uh, as we call the littles, I like the way you point that. Um, I'm so grateful to know that we secured a $1.6 million grant to support the purchase of obviously more devices um, but in, in in the meantime, so what are we going to do, those folks, you know, to get them orientated? How, so I feel like outreach is going to be way, way more important, right? Is that is that what, is there a plan in place to to ensure that because those kids who who don't have those devices K through two, um, what what's what's the plan there? How are we going to achieve that equity? Go ahead, Kim. <laughs> So what we've tasked the principals with doing is sending out messages to their families, in, um, their K-2 families, to understand which families, which students do not have access to any device. And then they're compiling that data. And what we're going to do is get um, iPads that exist in the schools to those families so that, you know, at least they will have something until we can give them a laptop. And now you're talking class dojo, is that how we're going to act? So each school, are they going to utilize their... Schoology. Their Schoology, excuse me, excuse me. I said class dojo. So that, that was another, actually, that, a good point. I have families that are still used to using, like, class dojo. They got orientated to Jupiter, and, like, they're still... So they're actually nervous to start to do... And principals are still communicating on those, as our teachers, on those <laughs> platforms still, so that they can then transition families to Schoology. Now, uh, how are we reaching those uh, populations that don't speak primary English at the home? Because I have those families too who really don't, who can't really, you have, you have your, you know, your families, your parents who really rely on the school systems and, you know, in the classroom. How, how do we, how do we reach those parents? Are we providing um, translators at the parent information center? Like what, what kind of um, services are we providing for they, for them to really digest the new uh, school G uh, system? 
Uh, I'll speak to that. Uh, so uh, Parent Information Center, there are a number of bilingual staff uh, in that office. And uh, uh, we, I would say that the, uh, the majority of families that come into the Parent Information Center uh, are uh, families for whom English is not their first language. And so we're mindful of that and have um, shifted staffing down there accordingly. Um, all of the virtual town halls, all of the written communication um, is available to families, uh, at least in English and Spanish. Uh, and then, you know, the reopening document, things of that nature have been pasted in uh, on the website with the uh, making it available for the using the translation widget into, you know, 27 different languages. Uh, so we're, 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 we're uber mindful of that, but you know, you, 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 you mentioned outreach, um, you know, last, uh, actually Monday of this week, we had a virtual town hall on, uh, on special education. Uh, and we had, you know, grand total about 600 families participate, 200 of which, uh, were families for whom their first language is Spanish. Uh, and that was facilitated by our, um, Assistant uh, Administrator of SPED and uh, and and uh, Guillermo Sinelli, who you know comes to most of our school committee meetings and will translate for any family that needs it. Uh, so we're, we're we're really we really want to make this accessible for all families. The outreach is being done in in multiple languages. Um, you know we're we're definitely mindful of that. Uh, Deputy Superintendent and Ruggiero, I think you have your hand up to speak to that. Yeah, I just wanted to note that the videos that were released today um, on our website uh, Ash that Ashton Dean did, she did with a student, um, and the student did the identical same video instructions. They would he was demonstrating how to log into the computer, uh, both in English and in Spanish. And for Schoology, the same thing will happen. There will be demonstrations of how to log in, what the, you know, how you maneuver in Schoology, and that will also be in English and in Spanish. Deb, I, I just have, one of my concerns is, is, is those students who have um, really severe learning disabilities, you know, those students who really, that, that's a real concern, special ed, ESL, uh, those are really students that are in particular that I'm really concerned about. I know I've families that reach out. I even have staff reach out. So as long as I think that the orientation is very important, especially the route that if, as long as, like you said, I, I'm, I appreciate the, the transparency with that. So I just really want to put that out there. No, we are also very mindful of that, Brian. Um, next member Capola, then I see member Gately has her hand up. Member Coppola. Yes. Um, I'm glad that, that uh, Brian addressed the um, special ed because that's a, that's a concern. But the, um, I, I, just before we got on the meeting, I had two parents right away still looking for the devices. So we're still not reaching everybody. Um, you know, one of them said that she's been calling the school and uh, the answering machines not hooked up. Um, in these schools, and or if they are, are people are we returning those calls? Are there? You know, I know the clerks probably are not in that. In the they are here. Um, the elementary's also. We yeah. brought them back. We brought them back two days early. Okay. Um, well, actually, we brought them back seven days early. Uh, next week and um, uh, two days this week. Um, so uh, you, you know it. it strikes me as odd that the, the machine is not working, but I would say that um, principals have been doing um, you know, massive outreach on the um, device pickup, um, usually through the all call. They've been in the offices you know, daily, uh, answering calls from families and directing them to um, uh, you know, where the, the, the pickup spaces are. Um, but I, I would say, you know, families should call the help desk also if they uh, are, are just have a question about uh, anything related to the device, including pickup. 781-477-7342 uh, um, they can help them in any way that they need. 
Okay, now they are, they are using the all call, though. The principals are using the all call. Okay, that's good. And um, the other thing is on the um, food provider. I know that we have a new provider or a different food program. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that the food was good. So uh, maybe Kevin might want to just get into that and explain that. Kevin? Uh, yes. yes, can you hear me? Yes, yep. Oh, okay, yes. Um, you know, uh, yes, this year uh, we, our food provider in the past was a company called Preferred Meals. Uh, this year it actually, the company is Chatwells, but they teamed up with a company called Revolution Foods, uh, who's technically out of California, but they uh, worked with the Boston Public Schools a couple of years ago <laughs> and been doing a lot of work with them. Uh, and what they are doing is they are cooking um, and making meals. Nothing is frozen. Everything is made within the day or day before and delivered to the schools. And uh, as the superintendent said, they provided us a, a sample box that we'll be passing out. And it had like spaghetti and meatballs in it. And it had sandwiches and it had salads and fruit. And it had like breakfast materials and so these are the foods that are all the elementary schools that will be going with. The secondary schools will still be cooking meals and packaging them up in a similar way so that we, we try to get away from anything that was previously frozen and it would have to be reheated. For example, the uh, spaghetti and meatballs kit would just have to be put in the oven. Uh, the boxes are going to have directions in Spanish and English, and it would lay out like what the meals would be for day one, the breakfast. This is a breakfast this is the snack, this is the lunch, and that would be for day one and day two. So we kind of trying to think it out as much as possible. And um, when the people take the box and they open it, they can go home and their instructions are in both Spanish and English, which will be very helpful for people if they needed to heat anything up. Thank you, Kevin. The other, that the, it, that's, that's good um, on the meals. The other question is, um, because people have to walk to get these, are the high school students allowed to pick up any of the meals at the elementary? Oh, yes. All, the only, this is considered, the only difference between now and the summer is, in the summer, you can go to any school. That's, that's the nice thing. As long as you know your student ID number, or if the student comes up and says their name, we have to pull them up on the computer just to ensure that they are a Lynn Public School student. That's the only difference. But yes, if they live next to an elementary school and they want to go there, that's closer to their house, they can do that. Great. Great. Uh, and I know Member Gailey, but I'd just like to, because uh, I know there's a lot of people watching and there's at least 100 people on this Zoom. Um, we're talking about safety in the community. And um, it's, it's important, you know, we really need to, as a community, come together and follow the guidelines to help limit the spread of COVID in, in the city. And that means, you know, everybody should be wearing masks when they're outside. Um, you know, social distancing, washing your hands. If you're sick, you know, you should not, you should be calling your doctor and getting a test. There's four test locations in the city. Uh, if you, if you, uh, if you have been contacted, it's really important to the, to the people getting contact tracing that you give the appropriate information so we can narrow down where the spread is happening. You know, there's a lot of outdoor gatherings and people are getting together in bigger gatherings without um, taking safety precautions, which is part of what's happening here. Obviously, we live in a dense community with people having to work in service industry, and we're a different dynamic than a lot of communities in the Commonwealth. But for us to really take this on, it's important that we continue to do it together and, and continue to follow the guidelines that we've been talking about for months. So it's uh, this is an opportunity for us to... Um, understand that, spread the word. I mean, I know, uh, um, Ryan, you were talking about information. We need to spread that information out. We need to, as a community, come together and really be diligent about what, what we're doing and, and ensuring that we're safe. Uh, and when we're out and about, we wear masks and we, we make sure that we're not, in, we're not in large gatherings and gathering with people that could be asymptomatic and seem perfectly uh, healthy, but are spreading this disease in our community. So we need to, as a community, come together and address this together. That's how we were able to limit the spread through uh, four or five weeks over the month of July. Uh, obviously, the summer's been hot and people have been letting their guard down, uh, but the impact is across the board and we're seeing the impact, obviously, with 
the remote learning, uh, how it impacts our community. So it's incumbent on all of us to really work together and, and you know, really uh, be an example for other communities uh, and, and, and be an example for our friends and neighbors and family to really take this on head on together. So I just want to make that uh, the message is still the same. And the more and more data coming in reflects that face coverings absolutely make a big, big difference for those that, uh, uh, for both you wearing it yourself and people that you're, you're uh, coming in contact with. So uh, I just wanted to make that, um, you know, make those comments and, and, and we'll continue to do that. I've been trying to do that uh, across the board on a lot of different media, uh, L LCTV and Facebook. And again, sharing all that information um, with all of us here tonight um let's do it together let's let's bring that let's bring that spread down in the city and and, and uh get in a better place together so i know member gately had a question i i just and wanted to, that away. i just wanted to um address brian's questions about languages and ask deb um i know that in programs that i have taken um, Google tools that I could translate in any language, not just Spanish, but if I needed to translate any language whatsoever, I could copy the page, translate it to Khmer, translate it to any language, Brian, at all. This is the beauty of it. Am I right, Deb? Well, so on Schoology, the, for the parents, there's the ability, there's a drop down that they can choose what language they want the text to be in. Uh, and they will be able to see it in the language they choose. Thank you. Member Sadoy. Thank you. I just had a couple follow-up questions. Um, Patrick, can you let me know what we're doing or what this, uh, what's happening with the out-of-district students um, or those in day placements? Special education? Yep. Yeah. Um, those placements, I mean, I, this is the time of the year. Uh, I've come to know that uh, the number of contracts coming through for uh, between the Lynn Public Schools and those um, out of district placements, uh, you know, that, that, that number is high. Um, I, we, we've, been, we've been fulfilling and, and uh, adhering to uh, those existing agreements. Um, so any student who you know, had in his or her plan um, an outplacement, whether it's at North Shore Consortium or somewhere else, um, that nothing has changed related to that. Okay. And what are we doing with the local businesses that provided bagels and smoothies? Are they still um, doing? Okay. So they're still involved with yeah, the school. So uh, One Mighty Mill uh, is still part of our uh food service plan i don't know if you want to offer the details on that but uh yes we we still uh even though we switched vendors we would we ensure that we kept our local uh uh vendors actually we expanded to Domino's as well as firing some of the pizza that that we'll be serving on a you know when we do if hopefully when the students are coming back on a regular basis they'll be having pizza and that's part of the uh, other local vendor that has jumped on board so one money mill has continued uh, that's expanded throughout the program he was excited you know as you recall we started with the high schools and then did the middle schools. so now it's going to be universal even to down to the elementary schools this year so he's been really excited to work with us we're happy to work with him too and uh, which buildings do we use for the summer lunches how many people were allowed inside and were there any health issue incidents i, got I don't it. believe that go ahead uh, go ahead you start go ahead I don't believe there are any incidents at all to my knowledge as far as that. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but uh, the four buildings was uh, were Lynn uh, Classical High School, Lynn English High School, Marshall Middle School, and the Lynn Voc Vocational High School, the main building. So those were the four sites. And what were the uh, uh, rules with regards to how many uh, people could come in at a time? The the uh the meals were being pretty much fed at a doorway we had like a grab and go so we would have we had signs there that said you had to maintain six feet so people could just come in you know one at a time grab the meals they went in like typically we try we have a set of double doors you come in on the right swing to the left get your meals and go out the door on your right and the next person would come in okay 
And uh, Patrick, I, I, you know, as a special education attorney, I feel uh, for the parents um, of the students that are on IEPs and 504s because the progress is measured and celebrated, mm -hmm. and that pushes the student to continue uh, with their with their growth and, and their goals. So I think that the remote part of it is going to be difficult to have that um, that 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 connection, that bond, and uh, that they need with uh, with the the teacher. Um, so yeah, I, I really hope that our community um, is aware that, that that our behavior impacts some of our most vulnerable students. So when we're in the red, um, you know, it's impacting your, the, our entire education system. Public education system is impacted by the behavior of people that you know that may or may not even go to our schools. So it's 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 crazy. But I, I just. I know that everything is delayed and many entities, you know, they're spread thin because they could be on a skeleton crew or whatever. But I just, what, what bothers me is that we have to wait until the end of September, Patrick, for this report that I think is vital. Because even without DESE, I think the committee still would have wanted this information to make any type of determination as to the safety of our, of our, of our building once we knew um, what was expected from C the CDC and, and whatnot. So, um, if we can push them um, and, and try to get this information, you know, quicker, you know, it's, it's been some time, that'd be great. I, I just think that um, you know, this is information that we should should have some component to how what we rely on when we make decisions uh, with regards to who we're sending into these buildings. Thank you. Member uh, Nicholson. Thank you. I just want to make a quick follow-up point about the about the meals. Thank you for that update, Kevin. That sounds really promising about the additional fresh meals. Um, and uh, I know there's been some interesting things that Boston Public Schools has been doing on that, and and that's terrific that that's coming to land. Just a, a quick point on the vendors. You you know that's I, I'm, that's exciting that we're continuing the, the partnerships with local businesses to the extent that we're adding vendors. I just you know would would request that we try to use local vendors when we can, when that makes sense. There's a lot of benefit, I think, for supporting the community that ultimately benefits the students and in, in, in showing them opportunities uh, about what's happening in their community, supporting their community, um, offers potential for jobs and such in the future, learning experiences. So uh, if we, as we are adding vendors, uh, I think we should keep that top of mind. Great. Um, with that, uh, um, we're on to the next uh, item of business, uh, a request for executive session. Is there a motion? Make a motion to go into executive session to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining rela relative to the Lynn Teachers Union Local 1037 and the Administrators Association. Motion's been made. Is there a second? A second re requires a roll call. Mr. Cassianos? Yes. Ms. Capola? Ms. Capola? I'm sorry. Sorry, yes. Mr. Ford? Yes. Mr. Stanley? Yes. Mr. Nicholson? Yes. Mr. Sandler? Yes. Yes. Okay, with that, we will, with Dr. Tutwiler's um, um, guidance, we will go into executive session. Back into regular session. Motion to return to regular Quiet. session. Second. Okay. Uh, motion to the second. Uh, roll call required. Dan, you have to unmute. Nan? Maybe Mary can do it, because I don't see Nan. Uh, Mary, would you take the roll call? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Mr. Castellanos? Yes. Ms. Coppola? Yes. Mr. Ford? Yes. Ms. Gately? Yes. Mr. Nicholson? Yes. Mr. Sadaway? Yes. Mayor McGee? Yes. 
So the um, there is um, business from the executive session. Would anyone like to uh, present a motion related to that action? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Member Sadaway. I'd like uh, uh, to make a motion uh, to approve the actions that took place in our executive session uh, relative uh, to the uh, contracts with the uh, Lynn Teachers Union and uh, the um, LSAA, where we um, agreed to continue negotiating um, uh, certain parts of the contract and uh, given the authority to um, uh, the superintendent and attorney my host to continue those negotiations as well as uh, given attorney my host and um, Patrick uh, the superintendent uh, the authority to um, uh, move forward with the the uh, information that we agreed to at the last meeting with the memorandum of agreement with regards to the professional development days that are coming up which uh, would be optional So motion on the table. Second. Requires a roll call. Uh, Mary, uh, I don't know if Nan is, uh, is back yet. So we'll make sure. That, do you want me to do it? Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll make sure. It seems like she wasn't able to get back on. Mr. Mayor, do you want me to do the roll call? Yes, pl uh, yes okay. please. Mr. Yes, Cassianos. Yes. Ms. Capola. Yes. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Yes. Oh, yes. Ms. Gately. Yes. Mr. Nicholson. Yes. Mr. Sadaway. Yes. Mayor McGee. Yes. Uh, the last piece on the agenda tonight is um, communications, uh, Superintendent. Tell well. You're on, you're on mute. Nice conversation with myself. Uh, I have prepared uh, a superintendent's report, uh, specifically um, a targeting uh, information related to the um, the resolution uh, that the school committee adopted on June 11th, uh, wherein there were two specific. Uh, requests. Um, one involved the development of uh, inclusivity panels at the secondary schools to address, um, you know, issues around race and equity at that level, and then also uh, a district-wide uh, professional development designed to uh, support uh, the district's effort to confront uh, racism where it exists and also uh, elevate cultural competence. Um, Rather than um, share about that, I'd prefer to do a presentation uh, for the school committee uh, at our next meeting, which it will be soon, uh, probably next week. Um, uh, but I will post the report uh, immediately for, for folks to read. Okay, that sounds like a, a, a good proposal. Uh, Member Sadaway, would you like to speak to that? I was just going to make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> okay, so I think we're we're happy to have that at the next meet, meeting, Dr. Totweiler. Uh, and, and Member Sadowite has made a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Mary, would you mind uh, doing the roll call uh, as well, please? Yes. Mr. Castellanos. Yes. Ms. Coppola. Yes. Mr. Ford. Yes. Ms. Gately. Yes. Mr. Yes. Nicholson. Yes. Mr. Satellite. Yes. Mayor McGee. Yes. Everyone have a great night. Have a Thank great you night. For everything. Take care, Michael. Thank you all. We'll talk soon. Take care, Mike. Thank Good night, you. all.